Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 1619 Project Discussion Group presented by Pasadena Village. Pasadena Village is a local organization here. It's, we call it an intentional community, and it's an organization of people over 55 generally and generally retired who want to remain active as they get older. The racial discussion group that we have here was named after the 1619 Project, but we don't really discuss the 1619 Project. What we do is we talk about racism in our community, in the world. And what we want to do, our goal is to try to understand racism, how it reaches us, what it does to us, and what we can do to make it a better situation. And it's a discussion group. We don't have a position here. We take people's opinions and we hear how people are thinking and feeling and what they're doing with things. And it's an educational process. So that, that's we're looking for personal growth for everyone. Before we go any further, I would like to launch a little poll here. We've got a lot of people here and I would like to find out how people learned about this. So I'm gonna put a little poll up here and ask you if you will go and click on it and give us give us uh, some information about how you heard about this group. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it up there just for a couple of minutes so, or for a minute or so, so that everybody has a chance to uh, click on it. You can click multiple choices if you heard about us different places. So tell us whatever you can there. And uh, if you have anything else you'd like to say, uh, we're gonna have questions and Brian might take questions throughout. I'll let Brian decide how he wants to do it. But you can always put things in the chat and we'll try to get the things in the chat. Um, I can't read them myself, but Brian will be able to read them. And Brian, I'm going to make you a co-host, too, so that you'll be able to uh, do some things here and help out with that. Eric, I don't know how to answer the questionnaire. Uh, you should be able to just click on the answers there. Oh, it's, it's showing working. it's showing the results. It's not the poll. Yeah. It, it's what you will see once we take it. Okay. All right. Well, this was a tryout here, so I'm just going to stop this and we'll move on without it. So you have to launch the poll before you can answer it. That's all right. Yeah. Well, I did launch it, but it didn't it didn't come up the right way. So, all right. So with that, let's go ahead. So Brian, I'm going to, I'm going to make you a, uh, you can go ahead and start and I will go ahead and make you a co-host so that you will have that uh, at your control if you need it for anything, but uh, you don't, you don't need it for uh, sharing your screen if you want to do that. So go ahead, Brian Berry, uh, take it away. Great, thank you, Dick, and thank you for providing us with this opportunity today to share. And I think what we're going to talk about today will meet the, the goals that Dick outlined in particular to uh, increase our knowledge um, uh, about racism in general terms and discriminatory practices, um, and specifically in Pasadena. However, the um, the reality is that these are um, national issues, and so it's fascinating to see that there are people from other places around the country um, because uh, all of this is uh, relevant and adaptable. And what I would highly recommend is that you um, conduct uh, an investigation of the history of your own communities, uh, because uh, many of these artifacts, historical um, anecdotes, are repeated in uh, cities all over the country. Um, and as a starting point, I want to um, thank my colleagues and um, I guess you would say co-conspirators um, who are here with us today, who are going to help with the presentation and provide um, direct experience uh, examples. And then um, also some observations about um, some of the historical antecedents that have occurred uh, so I want to introduce um, Chip Williams, Danny Parker, and Alma Stokes. Um, and actually, uh, what, rather than taking time right now for each one of them to introduce themselves, they, they will do it during the, the presentation. Uh, they're all uh, longtime Pasadena residents. They have a wealth of information um, and they're currently in leadership roles in our community right now. Uh, what I will be doing is um, providing a, a PowerPoint presentation 
I will stop it um, on occasion so that we can uh, check in and have a, a conversation and have Alma, Chip, and Danny provide uh, some uh, greater content and information. Uh, but we'll use it as kind of a, a guide as a pathway for our conversation today. Um, and one key point is this is this is by no means comprehensive. This is I want you to consider it as an introduction or a, an overview. And I also want to recognize the fact that you have already embarked upon this process. For any of you who have attended the other 1619 presentations, you spoke with Pastor Lucia Smith from Friendship Baptist Church. We will touch on friendship uh, just briefly. Um, so it's a part of our conversation as well, but you're, you're very knowledgeable about him and um, the, the church's role. You also had a discussion about public education in Pasadena. I'm going to provide a little bit of information that I hope is, uh, that adds to your knowledge already. Um, there, um, there are a couple of uh, artifacts that I think would be important, plus the fact that Danny, Chip, and I are uh, graduates of the POSD, and then Alma was a teacher in the POSD for many, many years, and her children also attended school there. Um, so you, you have dealt with these issues. Um, so we're just going to build on that knowledge. So uh, with that overview, let's get started. Um, and um, because you, you had um, Pastor Smith come, uh, just a trivia question, and I'm gonna throw out questions as we go along. And, and as Dick said, if you could place your answers in the chat, uh, that'd be great. So first trivia question is how many times did uh, Reverend uh, Martin Luther King Jr. speak in Pasadena and just throw it in the chat. And if you know um, where he spoke, that would be great too. So uh, I see people thinking, contemplating, and by the way, uh, at our last presentation, we gave away the trip to Hawaii, so we don't have that today, but I'm sure Dick has a fun prize for you um, if you get it right. Okay. So actually, I'm going to give Chip an assignment. If you could monitor the chat, that'd be great, because once I um, share the screen, it's going to be harder for me to see it. And actually we're gonna do one thing before we do that um, so that I can see people a little bit better. Uh, all right, hopefully that. Um, sometimes when you're working on these, um, there are too many bars that are open. So let me see if that'll work. All right, so no answers to the question, uh, no guesses at all. Uh, anybody know where um, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King is, um, is uh, in this photograph? Okay, I've got him stumped already. Center. Both yeah, from he's, Right, he's in the middle of the photo, but um, but where is the photo taken? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so um, the the Martin Luther King spoke in Pasadena three times. Uh, once at Caltech in 1958, uh, and in my bibliography, I, which I can share with Dick if you're all interested in it, I can um, uh, I have an article that was written about it. Uh, he, he spoke on the, um, the status of race relations in the United States at that time. And then he also spoke at uh, Friendship Baptist Church twice in 1963 and 1965. This is 1965. This is uh, Pastor Marvin Robinson, who is shaking his hand. Uh, Pastor Lucia Smith's father is in this photograph as well. Um, so just as a, uh, the starting point, and again, this is why it's important for all of us to be thinking about the ramifications um, in our own towns, if you're not in Pasadena, 
Um, but it, this is a national issue. This is not just a, a Palestinian issue or quite often people think of it as a, south, a Southern issue. So in the real sense, uh, the, and, and when, I, when I use quotes, I use what they said and not what we would say today. But in the real sense, the Negro cannot be free in Pasadena or Los Angeles until the Negro is free in Jackson, Mississippi, Montgomery, Alabama. We are all involved in a single struggle. So that's also, um, we have people from um, Oregon here and then Houston, Texas, uh, so we can um, expand that. So uh, next question for all of you, why is this important to you? You're welcome to place that in the chat. Why, why is this conversation important to you? Why is this, why should we spend any time on this? This is a photograph taken uh, right after George Floyd's murder. This uh, was a vigil that was held at uh, Pasadena City Hall. Um, in, in the wake of the events that have occurred in the last two years since uh, uh, his murder, how, how are you feeling about social justice and racism in the United States? What, how is it um, affecting you? How, how has it changed? How has it been shaped? In this photograph, the, the person who's speaking in front, her name, name is Jasmine Richards. She's in the pink hoodie and um, she is a representative of Black Lives Matter of Pasadena. And there are many other people, including All Saints people in this photograph, uh, which is a church that I know some of the people who are here, Chip. Uh, so uh, Linda Pope says, the dream has not been realized. It's evolved into a nightmare. Do you, do you want me to raise my hand and share the comments as yeah. you go. Yeah, let's, let's do it, especially if there's something that's important to lift up. Um, okay. All right. Great, thank you. Thank you, Linda. All right, what will we be talking about today? We're going to be talking about, um, pa Pasadena is often touted as this inclusive progressive city, which um, which in some ways there, you know, it is, but it, uh, it obscures our history. It, it obscures the fact that, um, that we have had um, direct intentional uh, racism, segregation, uh, systemic exclusion. Uh, and so we kind of think of ourselves as this uh, noble sort of um, place on the hill that everyone looks up to, but it, it doesn't erase our past. So we need to talk about our past. Um, Pasadena is a home to a thriving black community, which has been damaged over the years and has had to adjust. And we'll talk a little bit about those adjustments. Uh, race, racism and discriminatory practices still exist in the community. And actually that's one area where Danny and I uh, wanna dive into a little bit more today if, uh, if we have time. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, Pasadena represents the rest of the country and its uh, complexity and diversity. And um, so, there are parallels there. Um, so we're gonna talk about um, another question for all of you. You're welcome to put your answer in the chat again. How might studying our history help us to create an equitable and just community? And I think that goes to what Dick was saying about why we are doing what we are doing. Uh, we, want to, um, we, we want to aspire to the democratic notions that we all uh, share and believe in uh, and actually make this a fair and just community chip. So uh, answering uh, the last question, there are two more answers. Uh, healing from racism and bringing reality closer to the dream is an ongoing effort from Will. And then Melba says social justice had fallen off the radar until Floyd's death. Oh, so true, uh, so true. Those are really, really helpful. Thank you for making those comments. So and we're gonna talk about- The new question, there, there hasn't been a, an answer yet. Okay, no problem. Um, uh, we're going to study Pasadena's early history. We're also going to study a little bit about uh, U.S. history overall, just some, um, uh, some um, general facts that have occurred. And then we'll talk about the vibrant community that we were talking about, uh, that I mentioned earlier, per pervasive discrimination and exclusion, and then where we are today. So, um, Chip, why don't you hold the comment just for a minute, and we'll, we'll do a little bit more information, then, then we'll swing back. Mm -hmm. um, so why am I giving this presentation? You can find me somewhere in the photo. Uh, we, we actually, what we did a couple of years ago is we, and Danny was a part of this, uh, we, and Alma as well, 
we created a bus tour. The bus tour was um, a mechanism by which we could investigate more deeply Pasadena's history. So we went to Friendship, we went to uh, the Brookside Plunge, which is now Rose Bowl Aquatic Center. We went to St. Barnabas Church and we went to Woods Valentine Mortuary. We're gonna talk about all those today. Then COVID hit, we couldn't do it anymore until this year. So we just did one in May and uh, uh, Danny and um, Alma were, were, with, were on the bus and it was an amazing trip. We did a different um, uh, tour and I can um, share that with Dick later on if, he, if he's interested. But the whole idea is to, desi the, our desire is to live in a community where everyone is treated equally and with respect. So that's, that's what we're hoping for. And that's, that's why we have given this presentation, um, I don't know, 15 times at least around Pasadena. And that's why we keep doing it because we want, we want to reach that uh, equitable and respectful uh, community. Uh, so Chip, uh, why don't yes. you? So answering the question, why do, we, why do we do this? Why do we study the history? Melba says, by sharing our history, it will help us not to make to not make the same mistakes again. And then Will says, it gives us a perspective to show where we've been and where we are now, so we can know where we go, where we can go. Those are really, really helpful and and so true. So thank you uh, for reading those and thank you for submitting them. So let's build on that. Let's think about our history. So early Pasadena history and you. You study this a little bit with the uh, Pasadena Museum of History representative who came and spoke to you a few uh, months ago. So um, the, the, this is, I, I'm not gonna go into all the detail that he did about the Prince family and the Carr family and some of the others. Um, so, but we're gonna talk about general trends. Um, so, uh, and uh, th this is a photograph um, from Pasadena. Um, and actually another trivia question, and we gave away the Volvo last week, so we can't give that today, but Dick has great prizes for you. Um, the question is, what year was Pasadena incorporated? Uh, so just type that in the chat if you know. Um, the Orange Packing House, this is uh, Frank Heidenreich's Orange Packing House. It was um, located just outside of Old Pasadena. And as you can see, it was a, uh, Pasadena of course was founded on uh, many of the cities, whether it's uh, Covina, San Dimas, Redlands, Riverside, they had huge uh, citrus groves. Um, and uh, that was the thriving economy at that point in time. So many of the field workers were Chinese. And as you can see at the top, hopefully you can see that sign, it says no Chinese employed. So Chinese were uh, allowed to uh, work in the fields. They could pick the oranges, but they couldn't pack them. Uh, and they weren't allowed in old, old Pasadena area. They were uh, kept on the outskirts. So this, the, the reason why I bring this up historically is that this is a, um, a very clear sign of discrimination, uh, systemic exclusion uh, in Pasadena uh, right from the very start. So, uh, I didn't see anyone answer that uh, question. Pasadena was incorporated, so um, officially um, made into a city in 1886. Uh, so another part of the backdrop is the Great Migration. Uh, Great Migration um, was the mechanism by people after the Civil War decided, you know what, um, I want to look for different opportunities. I want to look for a, a better life for my family. And so I'm going to move. And these are uh, some of the pathways that people took. Um, uh, moving to other cities, uh, you know, Seattle, Detroit, Cleveland, and then to Los Angeles and ultimately Pasadena. And we'll see, we'll have a chart a little bit later on on the population growth in Pasadena over, over the decades um, and, um, with, in particular, the African-American percentage. So um, we must talk about the Great Migration and then also Jim Crow. And Jim Crow was one of the reasons why people left. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a second. Nicodemus, uh, just a quick mention of this. This is actually a National Historic Site. This is a town in Kansas. Uh, it was developed as um, uh, an African-American city entirely. 
Uh, the reason why it's relevant here, it's two reasons. One, it's a part of the great migration in the sense that people said, you know what, I'm, I want to leave Mississippi. So let's, uh, and in this case, I want to leave Kentucky. So let's go to a place in Kansas and we can start our lives fresh and we can have um, an African-American centric town. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's in the national park system. And what it, uh, the reason why it's connected to Pasadena is that settlers there, their families, at least one of the families that I've researched came to Pasadena, ultimately lived here in Pasadena and then uh, actually moved back to Nicodemus um, and are a part of the annual celebration that they have. All right, Jim Crow. Um, we're all familiar with Jim Crow on a, a larger scale, um, but a lot of people, well, some people feel as though Jim Crow is a, a more of a Southern sort of a, a phenomenon. Jim Crow was everywhere and it followed people all across the country. Um, we'll talk about uh, the Carver Hotel later on when, um, and you studied that when you talked to the Pasadena Museum of History. Um, but there were, there were places where uh, people of color, in particular African-Americans, but also other people of color, they couldn't go. Uh, they weren't allowed to participate. And so um, there is a, an author, she actually, her name is Lynn Hudson, and she uh, is a graduate of Muir High School. Alma knows her really well. And um, so a portion of her book, which is called West of Jim Crow, The Fight Against California's Color Line, has the, the Pasadena story of the Brookside Plunge in it. Uh, she she uh, conducted research and found Ruby McKnight Williams and actually, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause my um, speaking real quick. And I'd like to ask Alma if she can tell us who Ruby McKnight Williams was. And Ruby said, I didn't see any difference in Pasadena, Mississippi, except they were spelled differently. So Alma, um, what, what was Ruby's role in Pasadena? Who was she? And go ahead and unmute your, um, your screen. First of all, Ruby came from back uh, in Kansas and she came to Pasadena. She was a kindergarten teacher and she couldn't get a job. And so she has worked in Pasadena for many years and trying to make changes. And she was a very important person in our NAACP. In fact, every year we have a, we have a banquet in her name using the Ruby McKnight Williams Banquet because of the, all the works and things that she had accomplished here in Pasadena. But she found it was no different in Pasadena than any other place. Yes, and that, that banquet every year honors people in the community uh, for their service to the community. And it's, a, it, and it's you know, COVID, uh, has affected our lives in many ways, uh, but they didn't, they didn't hold it one or two years, which was sad because these, these um, events are really, really powerful ways to uplift the community and to recognize community service. Danny, did you have anything else you wanted to add about Ruby? No, not specifically about her, but other than just to add that my father grew up in rural Mississippi, and when he was 18, he came to California to join the rest of his family, including his mother, and he shared a similar sentiment. He felt in Mississippi, he knew where people stood, and the racism as blatant and brazen as it could be at some times was up front. In Pasadena, he found it was somewhat disguised, but it came from the same resource, or not resource, but came from the same source and well of, of just utter disgust and, and mistreatment towards those of other races. So it, it, it was the same issue, but just with a slightly different facade or face to it. Great, thank you, Danny, for adding that. It was very helpful. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about early um, African-American history in Pasadena. And so this is, and I think the Museum of History talked about this, so I won't mention it too much, uh, go into too much detail, but Carrie McAdoo, this is 1909. She owned a store um, down near where Huntington Hospital is located on South Fair Oaks. She, she was a part, the reason why this is salient is she was a part of the Great Migration. So she came from Arkansas. Uh, she and her husband were looking for opportunities. Uh, they moved to Pasadena in 1899 and eventually she opened up this store. This store 
uh, here's an interior of the store, what ended up becoming extremely successful. And one of the other reasons why this is important is the location. So we're gonna talk about a section of the city of Pasadena and I'll show you a map, um, especially for people who are not from Pasadena, that was uh, predominantly uh, African-American and also uh, Latino or Mexican-American, and then had also Japanese-Americans living in this sector of the city. There's a new um, uh, project that opened up a couple months ago called the 10 West, uh, 10 West Walnut. And there is, uh, it's at the Parsons site. So if you have time to walk through there and see uh, some of the historical markers, it's really, really valuable. But it shows you essentially the area of town that was uh, designed, and th this is a key term, the designed for uh, people of color to live in. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, why that was the case. Well, one last point about, um, I always ask people, what do you see in this photo? Uh, since we're not in a live group, it's hard to do that, but um, just take a look at it. What I always see, um, I mean, obviously it's a very, um, it, it's a well-organized structured store. Um, it looks like it offers quite a few different products, but the, in addition, or in addition, there's a small white child uh, who's in the, the store. So she serves the, the broader community um, and the, the historical uh, record that I've read, she became one of the most successful business owners in the city. And uh, so she, her, puppy, her store was very popular. Um, and then also in the back, there's a gentleman with his hands on his face. So he appears not to want to be photographed. So just a couple of items to point out. All right. So I love maps. Some people don't like them uh, in this day and age of virtual world and everybody's got, you know, whatever the Google map or Waze on their phone. They don't, people don't look at maps as much as they used to. I'm hoping with this group, uh, that's a little bit more, um, shall, we, shall we say mature, uh, that you like maps like I do. Uh, and so let me describe what this map is. This is a map from the city of Pasadena's planning commission. So this is an official city map. Uh, this was uh, created in 1935 and it measures the, what they de described the dis distribution of African-American families or individuals actually in Pasadena. So each dot, if you look, if you focus in on each dot, each dot represents 10 individuals. So um, you can see the, the uh, areas where there are multiple dots this means that there are literally hundreds of people who are living in that area, not just dozens. So uh, the horizontal yellow line in the very kind of in the middle of the map, that's Colorado Boulevard. So that, that should be your kind of plane of access. Uh, so Colorado Boulevard. The other yellow line that is horizontal then goes vertical, that's Orange Grove Boulevard. So uh, then, then the last point is the blue lines, the two blue lines, those are light rail lines. Well, actually the, the blue line on the right is the Southern Pacific Railway that went through old Pasadena. And then the other one is the, uh, the light rail line. Um, we can see, so why there, there's a group of dots just below Colorado and to the west uh, or to the left of the, the box at the bottom, and that, that box is Fair Oaks Avenue. So why would, why would people live there? And uh, <clears throat> you can place that in the chat. Why, why did people live in that area? And actually, why don't we, why don't we go to um, Alma first and um, answer that question. So why, why did people live in the old, pa why did people of color, in particular African-Americans, why did they live in old Pasadena, Alma? Then we'll go to Danny. They lived in old Pasadena because that was, made them close to Orange Grove where uh, in that area where they had uh, expensive homes and they, they were maids and, and they were gardeners and different people that worked for these people. And that's why they were masked in, in that area. 
but there were nice homes. It was very good. And, uh, but, and that's where Wood Valentine Marchuary was placed until the freeways, but we'll go into more depth as we go. Great, Danny, uh, what would you add? I would be a little blunter and maybe a little less polite and say that's only places black folks were allowed to live. Pasadena was no different than just about everywhere in the country. And if you look at that vertical line Brian referenced as, as Fair Oaks, you'll notice that almost all of the dots are west of Colorado Boulevard, or Fair Oaks. Blacks were allowed to live in Northwest Pasadena and in that portion of Southwest Pasadena just referenced. And again, like so many, many other places, Black folks were only allowed to live in certain parts of communities and Pasadena was no different or no better than just about every city in the United States. Great, and Chip. Uh... Yeah, so, um, well, <laughs> there's some other comments now. Claire Gorfinkel echoed what Danny had to say. Be, they lived there because they could and because others lived there. And then Will says, a Pasadena-based realtor called it, oh, Coontown to me as we drove through it in the early 60s. Uh, and then Emily Hopkins says, wasn't there also a Chinese community around Fair Oaks in Colorado that got burned down? And then uh, Gail Metzer, Meltzer, sorry, were these families able to own their homes or were they predominantly renters? Oh, Good great question. question. Uh, so let's take that in particular. They own their homes. Uh, not everyone, of course, but there were many people who did own their homes uh, at that time in that sector of the city. And I'll, I'll add one other economic driver. So you see the Southern Pacific Railroad uh, line, the blue line on, to the right of Fair Oaks. Uh, they, there were jobs there as well. And one of the main ones was being a porter. Uh, so you would, so Pasadena was a center of course for tourism uh, and had many hotels like the Castle Green. So there were jobs uh, around the, the rail yard or the train station and then um, working with the hotels and offloading baggage and then taking baggage into the Castle Green. So there were uh, other opportunities as well. And yes, there, um, there was Japanese American community in particular, Mexican American, and there was a Chinese American um, church that was burned. All right, so moving on. Uh, so let's talk about the vibrant community. And again, some of this uh, you covered with the Museum of History, so we won't uh, dwell on it too much. Uh, in particular, Francisca building. What a, what I, I would say is that I, I did a walk over there uh, last week. Um, I had a meeting in Old Pasadena. And so I decided before the meeting, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at these places. So um, this building exists and um, the Pasadena Museum of History told you about it, but it's Francisca building, uh, James T. Phillips Sr. Attorney, real estate broker. He commissioned the building. It's fascinating to walk around it now because it's, um, you can't, that there are curtains or blinds on every single window so you can't really see and then in the back there's a huge hedge and you can't really see into the back either so you can't really tell what was there so this is another reason why it's important if you just walk by and this is on Dayton right in between Fair Oaks and DeLacy if you just walk by you'd have no idea that a hundred literally hundred years ago or 95 years ago uh, this was um, owned and operated and run by James T. Phillips. He had an office there. He had, um, uh, you know, he was serving clients uh, with his uh, law practice. Um, the other part of this sector of the community, it's important to mention, someone asked about if, they, if people own their homes or rented, they own their homes. And there were many professionals who lived in the community. So you had attorneys, you had engineers, you had architects, you had uh, pastors, you had teachers. Uh, they all lived in this community as well. Uh, and then this is the interior. I would love to be able to go in the building one day uh, uh, to be able to um, you know, just get a deeper sense of what it looked like inside. Um, so it, it was, it was a, a hub for the African-American community in that area. So you have uh, that building is still there. Uh, Friendship Baptist Church is still there. And then we're going to talk about the Carver Hotel in a few minutes. And that building is still there. So there are um, anchors, uh, physical anchors that are still in the community. 
All right, so First AME Church, and this is on Vernon Avenue. So Vernon Avenue in that map, uh, and we'll talk about freeways and how their impact as well. But Vernon Avenue uh, is in between Pasadena Avenue and St. John. So a lot of you probably know where Ambassador Auditorium is and then where Ambassador College was and now is developed as townhomes and condos on the west side and then on the east side. Uh, there's uh, a huge number, it's like 800 units of uh, townhomes and condos on the east side. In the middle of the 210 freeway stub, or the 710 freeway stub, that's where Vernon Avenue was. So on Vernon Avenue was First AME Church and Woods Valentine. Alma was a, a member of uh, First AME Church. And so Alma, could you describe a little bit um, where the church was located? Oh, one other point before we go into that is uh, first AME was the first um, African-American church in Pasadena, and it was uh, originally organized or founded in 1887. Uh, so that also shows the, the, the foothold, the history of African-Americans in the community and how significant it was. So Alma, what was it like in the church? And then why was it moved uh, up to its current location at 1700 North Raymond? See, the church was close to Colorado, and it was beautiful structure inside and out it was there was a pipe organ there and there were only two other churches in pasadena the white churches that had pipe organs and the church in the churches in pasadena were big and they were very special first ame was very special to me as a young child i used to know about uh the the conferences and the different places they they would come there to first AME and use it because it was the biggest and it had so many uh things that you could open up a section and enlarge in the church if you needed it for uh it didn't have a balcony but it had this place you could open up and if you needed it for a larger congregation or group of people that were there and it was there and then the freeway took it and across the street from it was a Japanese church that was a house. They had made the house into a church. And when the freeway took this first AME, they took the, the Japanese church and it is up on Fair Oaks in Altadena, beautiful campus that they moved to, that they built after the freeway took their church. And the churches were the hub of everything that went on in Pasadena. We can talk about that more later. And uh, the woods in there, and those people built this church with nickels and dimes. And, and but as uh, Brian said, we had many, many professional people. And when I was a little girl, I was in San Bernardino, Pasadena was the place we can talk about that later. It was very important for all the surrounding communities of Black people. Pasadena was the queen of that group. Uh, Alma, one quick follow-up question is, uh, since you attended this church and you were in that neighborhood, what was the, what was the feel of the neighborhood? What was the experience like uh, to, to be in that neighborhood at that time? Everyone got along, and every and it was it was a diverse neighborhood, and uh, people all worked together. You never it was all anybody of color were in that uh, area, and and uh, it was it was a, a wonderful community, lots of beautiful homes, everything surrounding this church, and all of that was taken by the freeway, and there was nothing you could do. Thank you, Alma. Danny, was there anything you wanted to add? Just by, by way of quick reference, First Amy was one block west of where Parsons is, and the, now the 10 West Project. And Brian, I think, will lead us a little further into the conversation that it was not a coincidence that First Amy is now buried by the 710 stub. And two quick facts are, that I think are kind of telling. In the 1950s, when the Pasadena City Fathers launched their scheme, or maybe better, put hatch their scheme to do some ethnic relocation, to put it mildly. 
of the four largest black churches in Pasadena, three of them had to move due to the freeway and other urban renewal type projects. In the 1957-58 school year, with Pasadena Public Schools, there were four schools that had a majority of black students. Two of them closed down because they were predominantly in the pathway of the freeway and their enrollment dropped so low because the freeway removed so much of their prior boundaries. And I'm not too good with coincidences and I don't think you can attribute that to a set of coincidences. I think the simple fact is it was deliberate and pointed. Thank you, Danny. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up all of those uh, facts and shared them with us. Uh, that really helps our discussion. So um, you, you talked to Pastor Smith and uh, he's uh, an amazing wealth of information. So we won't um, uh, go into Friendship Baptist Church very much uh, because you're all experts. What I would say now is that when I spoke to Pastor Smith, he said, you know, it's always interesting. I look out my window and I see, you know, all the people who've moved into the neighborhood and they walk their dogs and sip their lattes, but they have no idea what Friendship Church is about and what, was, what is beneath those brand new um, townhomes and condos, uh, some of which are very expensive. Uh, so, um, there has to be, th this is another reason why we make, we provide this talk is because, is to help people to be thinking about, you know, what was there before and why was it removed? So friendship is um, the only uh, place that is still um, utilized uh, by the African-American community uh, as a remnant of that uh, historical era. Woods Valentine, uh, so this is a, a great story. The Museum of History probably talked about it a little bit. Um, so, um, but just a, a quick sort of um, introductory remark is that James Woods uh, worked on Holly Street uh, when he first came to Pasadena. And he, he worked in a shoe shine shop and he was offered a job by another a mortuary here in Pasadena and he accepted it because he thought it was a good opportunity. It's one of those uh, historical moments where a light bulb comes on and then um, he realized right away that um, he had to work in the back of the mortuary. He realized that white people did not want to bury black people in Pasadena, obviously, and that uh, black people were not permitted generally to bury white people. So he realized that there was a, a business opportunity and being savvy, he went to mortician school and then ultimately uh, opened uh, the James Woods Mortuary on Vernon Avenue, not too far from First AME Church. So Alma, do you, do you recall um, this building and did you ever um, uh, interact with the, the Woods family? Yes, uh, I, my husband was the last person to be buried from Woods Valentine before it was moved to, uh, to where it is up on Fair Oaks. And so, and, and it was a beautiful place, well built. Everything that was in Pasadena that was in the black community was classic. It was high class, it was not half done. And the same thing with the mortuary as it is now. There's so much you can go up there and see that's history that's right there in the mortuary. They can let you come in and see it if you're interested. And so basically that is what I have to say from that and see. My husband died in 1952. And not 52, 62. And so... And like I said, that was the last one there, the last uh, burial from there. Yeah, yeah and, and just, uh, you know, going on, building on what Danny said, it's interesting, you know, all these people had to move, and I have a map in a minute that'll show the movement. Um, and yet other communities were able to uh, fight the 710 freeway for 50 years and then prevent its construction below California Boulevard. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Chip. 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, share what Will had to say. He said a similar relocation in Portland by freeway and urban renewal wiped out the vibrant black area called um, Albina. And Albina was the, uh, or Albina was the product of redlining in real estate. Uh, gentrification also in Portland. And then Linda Pope says, search on NPR, a brief history of how racism shaped interstate highways by Noel King. Yes, that is a great uh, re reference. So uh, Linda, thank you for sharing that with us. It's something I've, I've looked at as well. So just a couple of quick comments about Wood, Woods Valentine. Um, uh, James Woods eventually passed away. Uh, then his nephew, Fred Valentine, took over the business. This is uh, Fred and the family, you know, um, getting ready to move or the, the building had stayed till uh, 62, 63, as Alma was talking about, and then moved to its current site. And she's absolutely right. It is still a uh, feature of the African-American community. And is, uh, you can go to the website and you can see the, the services that are being held there uh, weekly and, um, and has been serving the community for over 90 years. It's, and I always find it interesting that uh, an African-American business like this is not um, as well recognized as maybe some of the, the white businesses, but it, it's uh, an essential part of our community. So, And you know, I forgot to add, uh, at the mortuary, all the black bodies used to go there. And so they, and the city and places would send the bodies to the mortuary that were black. Then the people started, and later on started realizing this is a, 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 a very, profitable endeavor. So then they started fighting to get those bodies. Now they take, they each one gets one in their turn and, and of the extra bodies that the city and things provide. And it's just an interesting thing. Yeah, so then they're distributed more now. Yeah. Great, thank you, Alma. Uh, so a quick, um, update on the Hotel Carver again. This was a part of my walk last week in Old Pasadena and I was actually able to go inside. You can, just like Alma said, you can go into Woods Valentine and take a look at their historical photographs and artifacts. I walked inside this building. I thought it would be locked. There's a hallway in the middle that um, is, at least it was open last week. And you can walk in and uh, go down the hall and see there are about three or four historical photographs. None of them specifically reference the Carter family that owned the Hotel Carver. And they owned, they bought it in 1940 and the, the family maintained it until 1970. So one of the other parts of Jim Crow was if you were traveling and you were a person of color, in particular African-American, it was, it, you know, couldn't go to uh, the local Hilton or Sheridan or a Holiday Inn. So you had to figure out where else you were going to stay. Um, so there was a book that was developed uh, called The Negro Motorist uh, Travel Guide, uh, or, um, and some people call it The Green Book, uh, that um, was eventually developed and then places like the Hotel Carver uh, were placed on it. I did some research last week and the Hotel Carver never, I, in none of the editions that I could find was actually added to it. Uh, but this was a place uh, in Pasadena, right across the street from the Castle Green where uh, African-Americans could not stay. Uh, so they did have a place to stay. They'd, on the second floor, and, and maybe the museum covered this already, but on the second floor, there was a dining room. And then in the basement, there was a, uh, a club, which was called the Onyx Club and had um, some of the um, jazz, uh, talented jazz musicians of the Los Angeles area played there in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, so we'll, so you can go see the, the Carver Hotel and you can walk into it and walk around. One day I want to get into the basement, um, so I need to find someone who has access to that. Maybe Dick has the keys. So St. Barnabas Church, uh, this, um, so, um, and maybe having um, Alma talk a little bit about uh, 
Episcopalians in Pasadena. So it was originally, it was a group of folks in that area of old Pasadena. So they were on Del Mar. Um, they met in someone's home or in one of the members' homes uh, for many years. And they decided, you know what, we need a place to, um, to congregate. Um, so what ended up happening was All Saints Church was uh, the lay leader of, that, of um, St. Barnabas. And um, so they said, we're going to establish a mission uh, on Fair Oaks Avenue. So this is in that Northwest corridor that we looked at on the map earlier and built this, uh, constructed this building. So it was established as a mission of All Saints Episcopal Church uh, in uh, Pasadena, right by City Hall. Uh, and it was built in 1933. Um, Alma, why, why did um, All Saints Church build a separate mission for African-Americans? They built it because they didn't, uh, they didn't want the people that worked for them and black people to go to All Saints. And they wouldn't say you couldn't go, but they, that's why they did it. They would tell you, oh, we have this wonderful church and it was full of professional people. And it was very, it was, it's a beautiful, it was a mission when I went there, it's a beautiful edifice. And uh, I went there as soon as the freeway took our church, I knew that it was going. We, my sister and I went to Scott's Methodist and Scott's Methodist is where Parsons is now. And we were there the last Sunday before they took and, and tore down this beautiful built, brick building. And so we were driving and we decided to go into the Episcopal Church and it was so much like our own uh, AME African Methodist Episcopal Church. That's how I ended up there. And it became a rectory right at the time that I came in there, it became, it stopped being a mission and became an actual rectory of church with a, a rector and everything like you normally have. And, and they supported themselves where it's a mission that the diocese supports it. And so, and, and it is a beautiful little, I mean, it's still going and, there were, like I said, there were so many professional people, but they didn't invite people that weren't Episcopalians to come to the church. Uh, I knew the I knew the priest very well, uh, Father Norman, and he was my good friend, and he was the head of that church at the time I made the change, and that's why I did it. Okay, so anyhow, we're going to come back to Fair Oaks and that area. Right. And, I, and yes, and we'll talk about it in more detail. Um, just a quick follow-up is that times have changed at All Saints Church. Um, what are you, can you talk just for a second? You're a member at All Saints now, is that correct? Yes. And then what's your role or what has been- I was on the vestry role? at St. Barnabas, but uh, I just, it, it just wasn't reaching my needs. And I had a five-year-old child, she may have been a little younger. And I decided that I had to have a place where she could get a religious education along with services. And so that's why I went to All Saints. Well, I was good friends with Rev, uh, Father Regis or Reverend Regis. And he uh, was at head of All Saints. And we were football buddies. My son went to Polly and played football with his son. And so we were at football games all the time. And so that is, and he made me feel like I would be welcome if I went there, which it was very interesting. People were very nice. A lot of people were, uh, uh, you know, they would speak and they that was it. And it took time. And All Saints has made so many changes but they, they have been in the community of Pasadena doing every kind of thing under the sun to help make Pasadena a better community. And they're still, we're still doing the same thing. And we started many kinds of, people would get ideas and we started many kind of organizations like Grace Center, which took care of kids that were uh, misused as, uh, and, um, 
and people that were needed to find, uh, they were getting away from their husbands. I can't think of the word I want. And we also, uh, we've, we've done, uh, we helped the, the oh, what, I'm, I'm losing my thought. We lost, we helped all these different, like first day, uh, the AIDS, AIDS discrimination started right there at All Saints. Young and Healthy started at All Saints. So there are many that you can name that St Union Station. All of those came out of All Saints because they lived, they lived what they were uh, what they were uh, doing they, when they called themselves Christians or people that follow Christ. We don't want to say Christian anymore. Anyway. So, so what Alma is talking about is this transformation and uh, illumination uh, and a recognition of um, social justice, equity, um, fairness, uh, uh, being uh, conscious of uh, discrimination. So let's let's talk a little bit. Um, we'll we'll take a few minutes, um, and I'm going to speed things up a little bit because we're. I want to save a few minutes at the very end for questions from the audience. Um, so let's talk a little for uh, a time. That was a pathway, St. Barnabas is a pathway into an example of pervasive discrimination and exclusion. Uh, and you're all familiar because of the Museum of History with the Brookside Plunge. Um, so just for those of you who weren't there, just very briefly, uh, the, the pool was built in 1914. Immediately uh, following that, it was um, people of color were prohibited from swimming in the pool. Uh, the, the city was then um, confronted by um, the African-American community. And what they did is they created uh, what is known as International Day. And International Day was Wednesday afternoon uh, from two to 5 p.m. people of color could swim in the pool. And that was the day that was picked. That day was, <coughs> because that was the day then uh, the water was uh, removed from the pool and then fresh water was placed for Thursday morning so that uh, the white uh, patrons could utilize the pool. So this is a photograph of uh, International Day. One other point was it was fought by the NAACP for actually 28 years from 1919, the NAACP was founded in Pasadena and uh, it wasn't until 1947 that the California Supreme Court found uh, Pasadena in violation, and then um, uh, integrated, essentially integrated the pool. Uh, Chip, you have a quick uh, comment. And go ahead and unmute uh, your... If you go back one slide, we can point out, we talked about Ruby McKnight Williams. That's Ruby in the middle there. Just wanted to point that out. Oh, thank you. I, I shouldn't have accelerated there. Okay, <laughs> so... Hats off to Ruby. Thank you, Chip, for that um, update. All right. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, some of the comments I think uh, some of the members of the audience have talked about. So redlining, racial covenants, redevelopment, uh, and the Federal Housing Administration. So one of, the, um, one of the misconceptions about racism in the United States is that there, it was just a few bad actors or that it wasn't pervasive. Um, but what we're going to demonstrate in the next couple of minutes is that it was pervasive and that it was codified. In other words, it was, it was legal. It, it wasn't that it was just a few people saying, oh, you know what, um, I, you know, I just don't want to be surrounded by people of color. Uh, it was actually very specifically laid out and the Federal Housing Administration is a good example of that. So it created a risk rating system in 1934 uh, that said that uh, black neighborhoods were more risky uh, than white neighborhoods to uh, provide loans. So what is the problem with that? Well, the first one is it makes it harder to access a loan, right? Um, to um, um, acquire a mortgage. The second uh, problem is that it makes a mortgage more expensive. And by more expensive, that means that the interest rate is generally higher in neighborhoods that are more risky. So that means that you have to pay more, not only monthly, but over the, the entire cost of the mortgage. So um, the risk rating system was extremely detrimental to uh, African-American uh, neighborhoods. Uh, 
layer on that, that there was the Realtors Code of Ethics, uh, which stated that if you sold, um, and we're gonna bring in Chip uh, in this conversation right now, if you sold uh, to a black family in a white neighborhood, you could actually lose your license uh, due to a violation. So this uh, encouraged white families to, to buy homes and not people of color, in particular African-Americans. Uh, and the, the footnote is that the number one generator, and I think everyone on this call knows this, of family wealth is home ownership. So imagine if you, your family, your community, uh, your racial ethnic group is completely cut out of the number one generator of family wealth, then it makes it so difficult for you to um, move into the middle class, stay in the middle class, and then maybe even achieve uh, economically a little bit higher. So currently, uh, average black households have one tenth the family wealth of average white households. Chip, could you talk a little bit about um, your family's experience um, trying to buy a home in uh, Linda Vista? Yes. Uh, so my family moved. We have some feedback. Yeah, if folks could uh, place themselves on mute and then we can um, cut out okay. any feedback. Thank you. So my family, uh, before I was born, uh, my mother and father followed my maternal grandparents to Pasadena. My grandparents retired from Los Angeles into Pasadena. And in visiting my grandparents, my, uh, my parents really loved the Pasadena community, the tree-lined streets. The schools were, at the time, better than the schools in Pasadena and Los Angeles. And they decided to move in uh, about 1955 or so. I was born in 1960. So this story takes place around the time I was born. Uh, so I, I was born in 1960, as I just said. And my family uh, had grown, obviously. Now, at the time, my parents owned a home on Salida Road along within that corridor between the Arroyo and Fair Oaks that uh, Brian pointed out on the map and that Danny spoke about also. Uh, so that was a black community and a, a very nice black community. It was a well-kept neighborhood, well-kept homes, professional families. Uh, but with the addition of me to the family, uh, my parents knew they needed more space. My, my father liked the Linda Vista area and the San Rafael area, but he worked all day and my mother would, uh, would make appointments with real estate agents. She'd leave me with my grandparents and make uh, appointments with real estate agents in Linda Vista. And invariably they were very welcoming. They showed my mother a number of homes. Oh, Mrs. Williams, this is a perfect house for your family of five. And, and she'd say uh, time and again, well, my husband will get off of work at 4.30, 5 o'clock. Can we come back later in the evening to have another look? Sure, certainly. And as soon as my father arrived at these homes in Linda Vista and San Rafael, the house was no longer available. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. The house has been sold. We, we, can't, uh, we can't help you anymore. Again and again and again. So eventually, my parents, uh, there was a lot, a vacant lot on a North Arroyo Boulevard just above the Brookside Clubhouse. But again, this was in the, in the African-American community. And my father purchased that vacant lot and built the home that I grew up in as a result of not being able to purchase another home in another part of town. I'd like to add to that. Uh, there was a restrictive covenant that was on, on uh, Arroyo. And I live at one house away from Arroyo. And so I wanted to get some insurance. And the man told me, I cannot give you any insurance because of where you live. I said, you don't know where I live. You need to come to my house and see, see my setup. And you'll see I'm right close to Arroyo Boulevard. He did. And it made a difference. And Danny, don't you need to talk about your parents and their? 
I, I wanted to interject before before Danny speaks. I just I forgot an important detail. You may be wondering, well, why did they? Why were they welcoming to my mother and not my father? My <laughs> my mother was uh, my mother was African American, but she was not only fair skin. Uh, she had a very uh, European phenotype, naturally straight hair, uh, pretty much indistinguishable from from an Anglo woman. So didn't have any idea that she was actually African-American. That was an important detail that I left out. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that more with a different story in a couple of minutes. Uh, Danny, do you have a quick comment? Just, just to echo what Chip said, my parents experienced something similar twice. In 1958, when they were married, they had an extraordinarily difficult time finding a an apartment for a place that would rent to them. And they wound up later buying their first home in 1960. And then in 1967, as they were looking to move to a bigger house with a growing family, again, a kind of a parallel to Chip's family, they were looking and at the time realtors would always and only show them houses in West Altadena because at the time that was a designated place for black people to be allowed to move is go to West Altadena. They neither wanted to be disenfranchised, they wanted to remain in Pasadena and they battled and battled and wound up in 1968 buying a home in what is now known as Bungalow Heaven, a neighbor three houses south threatened the realtors along the lines of what Brian mentioned earlier and said, if you sell to those N words, I'll ensure, be sure that your license gets revoked. He later, after seeing what a disciplinarian my father was in terms of keeping his kids very well-minded uh, and uh, kept the yard immaculate, then came to love us. But again, those kind of prevailing attitudes were ever present in the 50s, 60s and, and didn't necessarily stop in 1970 when school desegregation among other things began and i think some of the lingering residue of those types of attitudes are still unfortunately with us today thank you all three of you and what i want to show right now is that codification that i was talking about earlier um or essentially the the description that i made is that um a lot of people think again, oh, well, these are just, you know, maybe a few realtors, you know, and it, they were just angry themselves. So um, this is the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, September 30th, 1939. Uh, it's dated at the top, even though it's small print, that's what it says. And so this is, this is the red line. This is, the, this is what it actually looked like. So we can see on the, just um, to give you sort of a, a reference point, Pasadena is in the left of the screen. And you can see Altadena pretty clearly at the top. Um, the red area is what we have termed as Northwest Pasadena. So west of Fair Oaks over to the Arroyo as Alma was talking about. And then that finger that goes down into old Pasadena. So it's visible it's clear it this is this is intentional this is uh, there, there's no hesitation uh to say that this wasn't uh done uh both from a legal perspective um a legislative perspective uh and that it uh, was intentional again uh the green areas that means uh, that's the, the best area for a mortgage and the red area is the worst. So what comes with it is I was describing or uh, difficulty to purchase a home there. And Brian, if I could add very briefly, it's, it's worth noting that there were no black families in Altadena until approximately 1954. So that map in 1939 where Altadena is all yellow or green is also consistent with the lack of a black presence in Altadena as of 1939. Great, thank you for that addition. Uh, we'll talk about redevelopment for a few minutes because this is really a critical um, story. Uh, so be thinking about the uh, Fair Oaks corridor that we discussed earlier and how people were moved from old Pasadena up Fair Oaks because of the freeway. So Woods Valentine, St. Barnabas, um, you know, getting rid of uh, Scott, United Methodist, some of the other, oh, first AME. So they moved up into Northwest Pasadena on Raymond Fair Oaks. And um, there, there was a, a thriving black community at Washington and Fair Oaks. So we'll, the Kings Villages project 
uh, was redevelopment in Pasadena. And we'll, we'll talk to both Alma and Danny about it. Um, the, this uh, still exists today as um, Section 8 housing. Uh, but what was there, Alma, what was, what was beneath these buildings before? And then what was your role in uh, this project? Oh, up and down Fair Oaks with all of these businesses and real every type of business of it, every type of business that you could uh, want and use, which made the black uh, community not they didn't have to go into the white community. They had everything that they needed in that whole general area. And <clears throat> so what they were doing, I found out I I left teaching. And um, uh, my sister-in-law had told me about this area. And, and so I thought, oh, this is a lot more money. I'll do it. And so anyway, uh, what I ended up doing is I was a relocation specialist. And what we were doing was we were relocating these people from beautiful homes, chandeliers, beautiful tiled uh, 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 fireplaces, you name it, and well kept. In fact, those people, oh, uh, they had a credit union in that whole area. That the black community was a very big, thriving, wonderful one. So anyway, they, these were supposed to be townhouses, eighteen thousand dollars at the time, and they had a big model and everything. They knew good and well that white people weren't going to move over into that section. And as I started working and moving people. That's when I realized it was just black re re removal. And along with uh, these townhouses, uh, St. Barnabas was involved and they had uh, like section eight housing that was built into the part where you now see nice homes that are right near, uh, um, near uh, Fair Oaks, uh, it's where Jackie Robinson building is. It's and Ham Hammond. Hammond, yes. And our offices was a church that had been a Catholic church. And that was our office for redevelopment. And so I worked in redevelopment for a year and a half and uh, had to move so many people. And L.B. Higginbottom, who is well known in the district, there is a uh, there, the room that uh, the the district uh, in, where where the district uh, has their meetings, uh, this is named after L. B. Higginbottom. He took care of the business end of it, and then uh, when one man was there in charge of it, he moved out. L. B. took over. He was the supervisor of the whole redevelopment, and. Then it ended up to be King's Manor. And later on, they redeveloped, they fixed it up and it became King's Villages. Thank you. So you were a relocation specialist and you were helping move people out of their homes. Right. Yeah. Into the Northwest part of Pasadena, lots of the, uh, and other areas, but mainly the Northwest part of Pasadena is where a lot of them, that didn't that there are lots most of them left Pasadena because they could not find places that those that needed to rent could not find places, and then uh, those that wanted to buy had trouble. Some of them were able to find places out uh, in Altadena and places like that. Okay, Danny, I don't know if you have a quick comment. I want to try to speed up to the next uh, section. Project. Yeah. I, I would say as, as, as quickly as possible, it's important to note the timeline of that. That project was first hatched back in, in the late 50s, roughly 1958. Emmett Mickle from First AME Church battled the city of Pasadena for eight to 10 years. If the city of Pasadena had been able to launch this project when they first attempted to do so, they might have been successful in attracting whites back to Northwest Pasadena in that immediate area. By 1968, the demographics and, and other factors, I think, made it much more difficult and it didn't happen. Those would-be $18,000 townhomes were converted into low-income housing, mostly occupied by people without ties to Pasadena. They'd come from Los Angeles. There was a ripple cancer effect of that project. It brought down the whole neighborhood. 
and it disrupted the fabric of that neighborhood and the greater Pasadena. People had ties to local businesses, job opportunities, and otherwise that were then disrupted, and they could not be recreated in other parts of the city. And as well as what Alma alluded to, you had a city that engaged in widespread discrimination. People were living in that neighborhood significantly because they could live nowhere else. When you then displace them from one of the few neighborhoods where they're allowed to live, where are they realistically expected to go? This was a tremendous, unfortunate ripple effect, and that is still with us today. So that's my not so quick comment. Thank you, Danny. It was <clears throat> extremely helpful. Uh, just real quickly, uh, and this was mentioned in the chat, <clears throat> freeway construction. So it's uh, Foothills 210 and 710 uh, freeway. This was another one of the codified uh, activities of the federal government. So the Federal Housing Administration recommended that highways be used to separate black neighborhoods from white neighborhoods. So Danny's already talked about the impact on uh, black churches and schools. And this is a quote uh, from the Federal Housing Administration in the 1930s. Incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in, sa in the same communities. Uh, this, this bridge is the, the bridge right by Devil's Gate Dam, Haha ha Mangano Park. Um, so it's the 210 freeway bridge. And just going back to Danny's point of, uh, you know, freeway pathways, how are, and the, the PBS special that was also um, mentioned earlier by Linda, how, who made the determination for the routes? Why were these routes picked? Um, and then what was the impact of those routes? Uh, here is an overview. These are photographs from the city of Pasadena. So you can see in 1965, the old Pasadena area that, that is uh, the area that we were talking about where Friendship Baptist Church, uh, Carver Hotel, uh, Woods Valentine, First AME, Scott United Methodist are all located there. In 1970, you see the uh, start of the change and by 75, um, it's completely transformed. So all of those uh, cultural uh, and business uh, and then um, uh, social ties were cut and um, 4,000 residents uh, were forced to move and over 1,500 homes. Uh, just a review again of the uh, map, um, again, just to reiterate where those uh, families lived in Old Pasadena. I think you have a pretty good idea of it. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about this just for a few minutes, um, but this also builds on the, the notion of uh, systemic intentional discriminatory practices and racism. So James Crimey is a, um, he's a student at USC School of Sociology. His paper on, his research paper is called The Social Status of the Negro in Pasadena. It's 1941. Uh, these are excerpts from that, um, uh, his findings, he conducted a survey in Pasadena of people with several hundred uh, respondents. Uh, the, the first uh, aspect of it was to um, uh, research and then um, uh, determine from the US Census the, the level of African Americans who were living in the, the city, not only numerically, but percentage wise. And you can see how it, uh, it grows. Uh, from 1.5% to 4.68% uh, by 1939. And um, one of the reasons why that's relevant is because it's not, um, it's perceived um, the, the, whenever people have fear, whenever they're concerned, they're anxious, it's the perception of that fear that drives decision-making. And so in this uh, first question, uh, is what would you estimate the number of African Americans in Pasadena to be? And the point of this slide is to show that the fear, it drives the estimate to be much higher than it actually is. So the 8% or the 15% have significant responses. There are just as many people who think uh, that there are more African Americans and there actually are than there are who are um, accurate in their assessment. Um, so how the problem with that is it drives policy, right? So if people are afraid of 
the city being taken over by people of color, then they, they um, make decisions based on that fear. So another question was, um, how, how do African-Americans in Pasadena affect the desirability of a city? Uh, as you can see, dramatically uh, make it less desirable is by far and away the, um, the response. Uh, so um, there, there was, and Danny alluded to this, but for a number of years in Pasadena, there was a, um, a statement or a concern that was referred to as the Negro problem. So there were many, uh, whether it's the redlining and the racial covenants, uh, the uh, marginalization and placement in certain neighborhoods, all of these were responses to it. So if an African-American family were to move into your neighborhood, would you A, be excited, pleased, thrilled? Uh, no one said that, accept them as neighbors. There's a small percentage. Uh, the vast majority of people said I, they would ignore their presence, agitate to have them removed, or actually move themselves, which is a pretty dramatic response. So again, this is 1941. The next question was, would you favor regulations to have African-Americans live in a section of the city by themselves? Again, the huge number of respondents said yes. Uh, so how do these attitudes contribute to segregated neighborhoods and schools in Pasadena and how do they contribute to redlining? Next one is if it were possible and convenient for you to prefer to attend, have your children attend a school, uh, having many African Americans, only a few, none, it doesn't matter. We can see that um, uh, no one wanted many African Americans and the, again, the majority wanted to limit uh, the number. So uh, the follow-up questions are, what is the status of the Pasadena Unified School District today? And what percentage of school-aged children in the area do not attend the POSD? Uh, this, and the answer is it's 50%. We don't have time uh, to discuss it. I'm sorry, we're, we have so much content and uh, we're running out of time. So this is just uh, another um, sort of nail in the coffin is the, the a desegregation plan by Judge uh, Manuel Real. Uh, Chip, Danny and I are all, all experienced it. And um, I, again, I wish we could discuss it more, but we, we won't today because uh, according to Dick, we just have a few minutes left. Um, the, the point is, is that to, two historical artifacts. One is that La Cunada was a part of the POSD at one point in time in the, in the 60s, La Cunada broke off and formed its own school district because it didn't want to be a part of uh, Pasadena's diverse school district. Um, and then uh, the other one is after the implementation of Judge Real's uh, order, 7,000 uh, children, white children, uh, or what was termed as white flight uh, left, which was approximately 40% of the white student population left within uh, three to four years of um, uh, Judge Real's decision. Uh, just a, there's so much more in education and you had a speaker on it a few months ago. So hopefully you're more um, influenced. Um, the Caltech library or Caltech has its own issues with racism. Uh, Milliken uh, was known as a eugenicist, and so race betterment by eugenic sterilization. They changed the name of the library. And then I wanted to end and give Chip the last couple of minutes to talk a little bit more about his mother. This is a photograph of his mother. This is 1958. Uh, so Chip um, and Dick's going to cut us off real quick. So um, Chip, if you could describe uh, briefly what happened to your mother. And uh, come off a of mute, please. Uh, very quickly, um, throughout much of the history of the Tournament of Roses, uh, there's always been a Rose Queen and her court, but few people today know that there was also a title called Miss Crown City. And Miss Crown City was not a young woman who competed to ride on a float. She was a city employee who was unbeknownst to herself, nominated by her co-workers to represent the city of Pasadena on its float in the Tournament of Roses Parade. I told you my mother and father had moved to Pasadena in the 50s. This is 1958, actually 1957. 
And my mother worked in the utilities department at City Hall, where, where it was housed at that time. And her coworkers liked her very much. They thought she was a nice looking young lady and they nominated her to represent Pasadena as Miss Crown City. She was honored, but again, she had not competed for this. Uh, my mother was coronated. She was taken with the mayor to cut the ribbon at the Sears and Roebuck in Hastings Ranch, uh, attended various uh, functions as a city representative. But when the Star News came to interview my mother and learned that not only was she married to an African-American and had African-American children, but in fact herself African-American, uh, that journalist went back to, uh, to the Star News, to the Tournament of Roses, to the city of Pasadena. And within days, my mother was asked to return the crown and she was told that she would not be able to ride the float. They told her that there was no money for the float any longer. So uh, that story, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, that story uh, made it to the Pasadena Weekly in about 2013, I believe it was, which created some energy around reconciliation. And by 2015, my mother was invited to ride the first float of the uh, 2015 Tournament of Roses Parade. Uh, I'm keeping it brief uh, because of our, our time constraint. Uh, one of the reasons why my great, great grandmother is featured here is because in the comments section of these Pasadena Weekly articles, my mother appeared on the cover of Pasadena Weekly three times, and every time in the electronic comments section, people uh, said, she's just a Rachel Dolezal, she's not really African-American, how can she be African-American? So I just wanted Brian to place my, my mother's great-grandmother in the picture with her, so, so like, this is what the one drop rule means. And you know, my great great grandmother is not my mother's only African American ancestor. My mother's family is completely African American. But I just wanted to make sure that we understand how this racism works in the United States. Terrific. Thank you very much, Chip. So just to wrap up, um, where can we go from here? Uh, the, the Danny and I wanted you to be thinking about how. How is inequity and discrimination occurring today in Pasadena, in the region, in the country, and what can you do about it? So everything from family uh, wealth to home ownership to access to capital to voting rights to police community relations um, to um, education. What what are the um, challenges right now? Um, so and then some suggestions for the sixteen nineteen project is to. Uh, support public education, especially here in Pasadena, uh, uh, teach critical thinking, uh, ask courageous well-framed questions, listen to the answers, offer examples. So one of the benefits of this conversation is that Alma, Danny, and Chip provide direct experience. One of the ways to move people best is through direct experience and stories as opposed to just opinion. So use examples from your direct experience when talking to family and friends to talk to them about race, racism uh, and discrimination. Advocate for each other. When you see opportunities, become a white ally, anti-racist, and then uh, challenge assumptions and continue the conversation where we've, we've done this numerous times where you, this is the list of all the places we've been to, uh, including um, neighborhood associations and churches and uh, colleges and schools, we would be happy to do it again uh, for anyone and to continue this dialogue. And I sor I'm sorry we don't have time to actually talk about it with you, but we'd be happy to come back. This is a part, this is only a portion of the bibliography. Again, I can share it with Dick if you want. Uh, I have, um, uh, it's even longer. And then the last thing is, can we all get along um, I, you know, uh, we're trying to prove that yes, we can, but it takes effort, it takes work, and it takes intention. Um, and uh, I want to ask everyone, what steps are you taking to make sure that we do get along? Um, and this is actually a photograph of me and my friends, and I'm still in touch with many of them, and Chip is too. So thank you all very much for your attention, your time and uh, for allowing us this opportunity. And I'm sorry that we went a couple minutes over. So Dick, back to you. 
Well, great. Thank you very much, Brian. This was wonderful as I fully expected it to be. And uh, I really want to thank you for uh, everything that you've done. And I will definitely be in touch with you about a follow-up uh, presentation. So we will talk about that and see where we can go with that. I'm sure we'll have a lot of interest in that. I want to let everyone know this is uh, being recorded. Of course, it will be up on our website as soon as we can go through the process of getting it downloaded. It will be available on our website. And we will have a little short write-up in our blog about this presentation as well. And Brian, if you will send me your bibliography, I will see to it that we get that up where it's downloadable and available from the blog posts that we'll put up about this article. So thank you very much uh, to you and Danny and, and uh, uh, everybody uh, that participated in this thing. And uh, you did a great job. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it very much. And I think everyone else probably did too. If anyone has other comments or suggestions they'd like to make, my email is rgmyers at gmail.com. And I'd love to hear from you what you think about this and the other things that we've been doing and any suggestions that you might have. And Brian, in your summary of where you think we should go, I'll just tell you that is what, exactly what we're trying to do. We want personal experiences and sharing stories and getting people to understand on, from a personal level, personal viewpoint, what, what this is all about, what it means, what the impact is. So thanks every much, very much, everybody. And I'm sorry the clock ran out on us, but the clock runs on its own. I don't have anything to do with that. So, <laughs> Well, I want to thank uh, Alma, Chip, and Danny for being with us today, too. So thank yes. you all for joining us. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciated everybody's contribution. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll move on to whatever's calling next. Okay, thank you for this opportunity, Dick. Pleasure meeting everyone. Thank you. Thank, thanks to everyone.